Hey guys, and welcome back to the Kane Audio vlog. Uh, this is part two of the mix down process. Uh, so yesterday I just sort of showed a few tips and tricks of loading up the project files, sort of just prepping stuff and kind of what I have as my template. Um, and the first thing I look at tends to be kicks and bass. Um, just before I hit record on the camera now, I just loaded the project because I know the last video, as I loaded Pro Tools, uh, it apparently knocks out the audio of my screen recorder. So you only got a audio feed from the camera mic and not the actual computer itself. So apologies for that. Um, I've checked it, it seems to be working this time. So hopefully you'll get a decent audio feed. Um, I also quickly just checked through the actual track as well uh, to give it a quick basic listen. To be honest, this is one of those sort of mix downs where there, there, there really isn't that much to look at because, I mean, it's Enzo Bennett, it, it, you know, he's a great producer. Um, there's really nothing stand out wrong with it. Um, there's still a couple of tweaks we can make, there's still a few things we can adjust here and there. Um, so I, th I think we've got a good one. We've definitely got a good track here. So it's a, it's a great place to start. And I think, you know, that's one of those things that uh, a lot of producers seem to think that maybe a mix engineer can make their track sound like a better track. And, and I, I think a lot of people get confused in that because, because the mix down process isn't about um, well, no, it does make it sound better. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, is you know, the, the mix engineer can't change the sound design. They can't change the musicality of the track. They're, and I don't think it's a mix engineer's job to make creative influences on the track itself. Uh, that's not to say they can't be creative with compression, EQ and whatever other tools they have at their disposal um, and of course if you sort of negotiate it with the artist that you think well have, is it okay if I do this then whatever but I'm gonna guess that most of the guys watching this you're not pro mix engineers because if you were a pro mix engineer you probably wouldn't be watching this YouTube channel so um, my guess is and I'm kind of aiming this for people who kind of mix their own stuff so what I've just said is probably a waste of fucking time. So sorry for that. Um, right, so kicks and bass. I kind of felt in part one, I felt like there was... Uh, the, the the kicks and bass just weren't sitting right for me. And, and actually, when I soloed the bass, um, I don't know if this came across in, in the video because of the audio feed, but I felt like when I soloed the bass and I was playing with that Transient Master it kind of just there was a lot of kind of very low end i don't know if it's because of the key of the track but but the sub is so sub that it's almost inaudible not only that i felt like the track just playing the kicks and bass alone before i'd even heard the rest of the track i felt like it was that robotic hypnotic eighth note stab type bass line and then when i soloed the bass and just played it on its own I'm not sure if it came up in your audio feed, but for me, it kind of felt like the bass note was almost a bit too extended. Um, I've just listened back to the track again, and, and I'm and I'm still feeling that, even though when you unsolo the bass and hear the rest of the track, it, it doesn't not work. Um, but I still get that feeling that that bass note needs to be short and stabby so I'm going to unsolo it now um, and I'll play just a bit of the kicks and bass and hopefully you'll get what I'm talking about. So obviously there it is what it is and then when we bring in other synths and later on in the track as it develops I'll play a bit more over there. So I'm loving that synth that just started coming in, by the way. Um, so 
I've talked about this in other videos and I've talked about the general sort of theory of if you want nice big long extended kick drums you need short stabby bass because that you don't want those low ends to interfere vice versa if you're going to go with short stabby big transient kicks then you've got more room to play with the bass line you can make your bass line a lot more of an extended sub bass that's all fine that theory thinking about it now kind of covers the, the 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 rest of the track really when you think about it uh so it's not it's not exclusive to the kicks and bass combo it's more just fundamental to that but listening to the rest of the track you can hear all the other sounds are all quite you know they they're sort of short and stabby and a, there's a lot of attack on the sounds they're not big sweeping sounds and and in fact throughout the track there aren't really any big sweeping sounds bar for one or two maybe um so with that in mind i feel like that bass note again i'll go back to solo it now and i feel like that bass note on its own where i was playing with the transient master i think i was on the right field with that when i brought down the sustain yesterday and just made it a shorter note so i'll just do that now so you can hear it's it's eighth notes and clearly side chained against the kick which is fine but i feel like the release time of those bass notes almost go against the grain of the track so i'll just unbypass that um or activate that and i'm going to bring the sustain down while i play it now I'm going to do that again, double click to reset and have a listen again. In fact, I'll go the opposite way just because I know it's a subtle difference and it is really subtle. And I think that's that's the key thing to focus on in, in a mix. You shouldn't be you shouldn't need to have to do obvious changes, because if they're obvious changes, if they're that obvious, they're more mistakes in the production side than anything else. So I'm going to swing this uh, sustain up 100% and then down 100% and hopefully we'll hear a, a bit more of a drastic difference there. So I think doing that you can you you get a better idea of of what it is I'm taking out of the track and it's actually part of the side chain it, it, it's it's have or is having an effect on on how steep the side chain is um but that's not necessarily what I'm wanting to affect what I'm wanting to affect is the length of the notes the release time of that note um it just doesn't seem to be stabby enough um and so all I've done is brought down the sustain of that note and then when the kicks and bass are played together let's have a listen so it's barely changed but it's just later on i found that when there were more synths coming in the bass notes are not super low down and they sort of interact with the synths because i think there are some overlapping frequencies again we might have to have a look at that later on again um but that's just something i, I wanted to sort of show you guys which which kind of carried on from part one with focusing on kicks and bass um and then the next thing is i'll just give it a bit of a listen because i did notice while i was playing you a clip there there was one of the sounds that just seemed a little loud in the track I think there we go it's there somewhere perk delay could it be that that's the one a 
again, it's a kind of tricky one to do because I feel like that sound is almost too loud. Um, but it's almost not. So let's give it another quick listen. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do to that is probably give it another uh, transient designer. Uh, so I keep calling it transient designer, you know what I mean, transient master. Um, and I think it might be just a case of raising the attack ever so slightly on that. And again, it's going to be a very, very subtle change. And then that will allow us, because if that sharp attack gets raised in, in gain a little bit, um, that allows us to bring the level down, but still have the attack at a decent level. So let me just play with that a second. Yeah, you can hear just, just by raising the attack a bit there. Um, let's see the levels on it as well. So that's almost at minus 10 dB and then bypass. Yeah, it's closer to minus 15 dB. So we're, we're, we're gaining about 3 dB in the attack there, which then means I can grab the, the channel and bring it down a couple of dB. And let's just go to in the track just before it kicks in so we can hear it come in. Yeah, so instantly I've 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 just brought that level down. Interestingly, I brought the level down there, thinking it's still just peaking a bit too high, and I brought it down almost exactly three dB without noticing how far I was bringing it down. You just do it by ear, and I think that's that's another trick actually, or tip I suppose, <clears throat> for when you're doing a mix. Try not to look at things. You've got so much visual stuff in front of you on the screen sometimes you need to kind of forget that that's there don't don't look at the levels too much I mean I'm sort of talking about these things so I'm having to use the levels as a reference but I think proof of what I just said is the fact that using that transient master and raising the attack slightly we worked out and established that it, it was about 3 dB louder the attack was so we'd given it an extra 3 dB of gain and then listening to it and not looking at the level and just slowly bringing down the level to where I think that, that feels more comfortable uh, turns out to be 3 dB lower. And whilst I could have done that by just looking at the level and gone, oh, well, I'll just go to minus 3. I've gone to minus 2.9, which is basically 3. Um, Whilst I, I could have done that, that doesn't make it right. And you're, you're better off listening to these things and going, right, it feels right or it feels wrong. And you've really got to be able to trust your ears in these sorts of uh, situations. So we'll skip forward a, a bit more in the track and see what else there is, because I know there's some hats and bits and pieces that, that start to come in. <laughs> Instantly that big synth that comes in, there are two of those by the looks of it, pluck drop and pluck drop two. Let's have a listen and see what the difference is. So that I'm guessing is the higher note. And there we go. So that second one, pluck drop two, that sounds lovely. I love that sound. And the first one, So I think that's one of the things that then it becomes a bit more of a creative decision where you start to go, it's not wrong, it's not, um, you know, it's not obviously too loud. Um, but again, I'm just going to skip back a bit and play it again and listen to those synths come in because I feel like the, the pluck drop one 
is a little bit too on the nose, I suppose. Let's have a listen. It is. Um, so I'm just going to play it and see what happens. I'll just bring the level down a bit. Yeah, so I've brought that down well, nearly 4 dB there. I'm going to bring the other one up because I really do like that sound. Yeah, that works better in my head um, because that, that first pluck sound so really it's it's at that sort of frequency I guess it's probably about between 800 Hertz 1.5 K something like that and that I think the human ear um, picks up most out of out of all frequencies I mean I mean the human ear has, has evolved to pick up the 1 to 2 K area the most um, because that's where the human voice lies. So it's it's that sort of sound and I think sometimes having an attacking sound at that frequency can just sometimes be a bit harsh. Um, so yeah, so I think I was probably right to just bring that down a couple of dB. Um, there was something else I spotted while I was listening to that. I spotted in the hats. Uh, 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 let's have a look. Hats. Could it be these? Yeah, there's something in that, and I think this brings me on nicely actually to, to the next stage. I'll just give that a quick save. So the next stage for me in a mix is, um, I mean, I you know, I realise we haven't got all the way through the track yet, but again, because it's, uh, you know, it's Enzo Bennett, so he's a great producer, there's not going to be anything glaringly obvious. There's not going to be... Um, you know, I'm not going to find a, a clap being 10 dB too loud or or the bass line just completely swamping the entire track. I'm not going to find things like that. Um, and I hope that to most producers, you'll be able to spot those yourself. They're going to be the big glaringly obvious things. However, that's part one or the first stage of a, a mix for me is, is the glaringly obvious, just your general levels. Sure, we'll tweak a few as we go along and there'll be extra bits here and there. But this leads me on to what I consider sort of phase two of the mix. And that's listening out for frequencies. So we've kind of crossed over now from um, that that first pluck sound. Um, was it was at the, the sort of 1K frequency level and that just seemed to sort of attack um, quite strongly. And it was it just sounded a bit harsh. So there are things we can do later on to, to kind of play with that and that's part of phase two. But the other thing then is this, this hi-hat sound that, that I was listening to now. It's an interesting thing that, that hi-hats, cymbals, claps, sometimes snares but totally depends on... I'll leave snares out because that depends on genre and whatever else. But certainly things like hi-hats, crash cymbals, rides, cowbells to an extent all the sort of top end attacking percussion um it's all high frequency sound there's there's no disputing that but one of the things you need to consider in a mix is if something is high frequency sound you still might need to kill the low frequency elements of it because as you can hear in this in this hat loop there's still stuff probably about you know 1k and maybe even below uh, so I'll just play that again it sounds like I, I can only sort of describe it as as the wood 
resonating on a hi-hat and you're hearing the wood being struck as well as the hat itself and it's that metallic sound is what we want that's why people strike a hi-hat but actually you're also hearing resonance coming from the wood so in a dance music track especially what I will quite often do is load up let's go for a simple EQ and I'll high pass it and I'll bring the frequency down to whatever near zero and I'll just slowly slide that up as I start to play the hi-hats and have a listen see that we're losing frequencies look we're losing sounds from about 600 hertz up, we're starting to lose sound. So again, it's one of those things that the hi-hats you sort of consider as, oh, well, that's 10K, that's 8K, that's maybe 5K, you know, at, at the lowest. But actually, we're getting down to 600 hertz here and we're scooping stuff out that you're not really fully aware of there. And and that's one of the things to consider. That's, I, I would say this is kind of reaching the end of part two for me. Um, I will do this on several other parts of the track, um, but I think it's probably pointless me going through each and every one on video because you kind of get the gist of it. But things like hi-hats, listen out, just solo it for a second and listen to any low frequencies. Even if you don't think you can hear low frequencies, I can almost guarantee there are some in there somewhere. So sometimes it's a case of just scooping that out and what that gives is that gives, it frees up a lot of space. So we only care, as a listener, we only care about say two, three, four, five K frequencies in a hi-hat. So anything below is a waste of space. But that doesn't mean that your speakers aren't trying to reproduce that sound. They're still, you know, if you're pushing 600 Hertz through a, a, a hi-hat, your speakers are going to reproduce that, whether you're listening to it or not. Your speakers are going to, you know, and that's using up valuable energy. Um, and that's probably something I'll talk about maybe in the next video. But I've always sort of explained a mix down as imagine your speakers have, well, if your speakers do have a, a limited amount of energy they can produce at any given level. Are you going to use that energy across amplitude or across frequency because one has to compensate for the other, essentially. So if you're using up valuable energy in the 600 hertz range on a hi-hat, then some of your synths that are maybe tickling 600 hertz, uh, they're going to be uh, missing out just because the hi-hat's using up that valuable range. So this comes to the big sort of trick, and it's a, it's a case of sometimes you'll find... Um, a synth might be a relatively high synth sound. You're playing in, you know, in the upper sort of third, fourth, fifth octave. Um, you know, and as soon as you hit sort of C3 and below, you're down to 130 hertz at C3. So that's really, um, that's really down into the bass level. So you know, A3, you're up to 220. So we're kind of out of the base levels, but we're um, we're still in the, the muddy field. So it's only really when you start going into the, the fourth octave that things start to gain a bit of clarity. And, and you'd be surprised how many synths sort of transition between octave three and four. And that's fine. But if you've got this big subby bass line below it, playing some extra bits and pieces, then you really don't need that sort of two to four hundred area in your main synth chords and whatever. So that's again something we might look at in part two just briefly. I'm, uh, I'll do the same as I did today where I'll sort of just give it a quick listen before camera so I know what I'm looking at. Um, so there might be a couple of synths that maybe muddy it up there but for this episode I'm gonna I'm gonna end it on hi-hats you know Focus on your hi-hats, your high-end, your high-frequency percussion sounds. Um, stick a high-pass filter on them and just see what happens. Just just bring it down like this so I had the frequency at zero and then just slowly slide the frequency up. 
I mean, already I can hear a difference there at 400 hertz. Yeah, it's, ooh, look, 666 hertz. Um, 600 hertz, it's really starting to make a difference. And there we go, it's, an about, it's about 1K where we're starting to now lose energy of the actual hats themselves. So I'd probably just bring it down a bit from there, maybe 900 or so. Um, and then if I bypass this and reset the level, just for curiosity, let's see what we've lost. So that's peaking at minus 21.3 dB. Take the bypass off now and reset. 21.5. So we've really only lost, you know, I can't remember what the other one was, but 0.3, I think. So we've we've lost 0.2 of a dB. It's insignificant. But that will free up some energy for the rest of the track to start playing with. Uh, sometimes I'll scoop them forward even higher. Um, with some tracks, you want your hi-hats really up top. And in which case, you can start scooping out a little more. And again, I might do this. Um, you know, it's going to take a few listens with the whole track playing together. But you might save yourself 2 or 3 dB and you can just bring the hats up by 2 or 3 dB like we did um, with the synth earlier. But it's just one of those things that you'd be surprised how much low end energy there quite often is in something as insignificant as hi-hats. And just freeing up that little bit of space down below um, allows all the other sounds that are in that area, so usually the the main chords or sweeping elements of a track, it just kind of allows them to really breathe then and, and you can bring them into shine. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're reaching uh, nearly half an hour now, so I'm going to say that's the end of part two. There will be more. Um, I'll be looking at probably some more EQ um, and I'll talk about uh, perhaps when subtractive or additive EQ is best. Um, there might be a touch of reverb in there somewhere um, and using reverb as a mix tool rather than a creative production tool. Um, and then we might enter into compression. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's still probably a couple more videos to go before we get to the pre-master stage. Um, so yeah, please do like, comment, subscribe. I I feel like I'm a fucking YouTuber these days. Um, but whatever, um, by all means, you know, watch as many of these videos as you can and, and buy me a GTR. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, get involved. By all means, ask me questions. I do read the comments. Um, you know, that's what this YouTube channel is about, is it's about sort of, you know, the music industry and, you know, at the end of the day, especially in dance music, we are just one big community and, and that's what we're here for. So get involved, give us a shout, um, please do share the video and I'll see you next week. Cheers.